Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to the eighth and last uh, webinar of the ASA Researcher MPA Monitoring Series. I'm Lindsay Benito with the Ocean Protection Council, and I'll be facilitating this webinar alongside Steve Ward with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and Rochelle with Strategic Earth. This webinar series was designed as an opportunity for interested members of the public to interact directly with researchers involved in California's MPA long-term monitoring projects. Our goal in facilitating this eight-part series is to support broad understanding of the research that is informing the upcoming MPA 2022 Decadal Management Review. If you didn't already know, last fall, we hosted four community meetings to both inform the public about this review that's coming up and to hear perspectives and priorities on MPA management. One consistent piece of feedback we heard was to let folks hear directly from the researchers to help them better understand the science that is informing this review. So before we get going, um, I'll just walk us through a couple webinar considerations and technical things. So as we move, um, can you click forward one more, Rochelle? Thank you. There we go. You might have already noticed that the webinar is being recorded and closed captioned. Um, we'll be posting the recordings on OPC's website um, and on our YouTube channel. So Rochelle can share those links um, in the chat. Um, if you have any difficulties at all, please email Rochelle. Um, it's Rochelle at strategicearth.com or send a message in the chat and we'll get back to you. Um, when it, if you have a question during the Q&A section, we invite you to participate and, and ask um, Dr. Star questions, you can do so via the chat or by muting yourself, and to that you press star six. Um, and to help us facilitate the Q&A session, if you haven't done so already, please um, rename yourself on Zoom. And to do that, you click participants in the meeting controls, you find your own name, and you click more, and then hit rename, and then you can change your name. Um, it would be helpful if you used your full name and some identifier if that is applicable. Um, if you wanted um, closed captioning, uh, you can turn on subtitles by clicking CC in the meeting control. Okay, and just a few meeting agreements to make sure this is a nice wholesome webinar. Um, just please make sure everyone listens for understanding and acknowledge and seek clarification from others. Um, forgot to mention this. Please put yourself on mute um, if you're not speaking so we don't interrupt um, others that might be speaking. Please openly discuss any issues with others who hold diverse views. Keep comments concise and focused on the topic at hand. And just a reminder that any personal attacks and offensive language will not be tolerated. And again, if you have any issues, technical or otherwise, please connect with the facilitators or our agency folks to talk through any concerns or questions. So we ask that everybody abides by these agreements. If you can't, we'll invite you to leave the meeting and watch the recording at a later time. Um, if you have any questions um, about anything you hear today or related to MPA management, you can get in touch with um, the department, CDFW, at the address that Rochelle is putting in the chat right now. And we'll post that a few more times throughout the webinar if you miss it. Okay. Gotten through all of the pre-meeting materials. I'm very excited um, that Dr. Rick Starr is joining us today. He'll be giving us a brief presentation on his work and his team's work monitoring mid-depth rocky reef habitat in California. So after the presentation, we'll have time to hear questions from the audience. So be sure to take notes throughout so you can ready to, to chime in. And without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Starr. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll start sharing my screen and I'm assuming you can hear me. You're good. Okay. Oops, glitch number one. Okay, um, is that coming through well for everyone? Super. Well, I'm glad to be here today to talk to you about what we've learned about the mid-depth rocky habitat through monitoring. Uh, this is um, a huge area in the state, uh, occupies a lot of the uh, state waters and is complicated as is mo are most things in the ocean. Um, we've had a variety of different people and tools working for about 30 years to survey the mid-depth rocky habitats. We started in the uh, 
well, we started prior to 1990 using fishing gear to uh, evaluate some of the uh, mid-depth rocky habitats. And then since uh, the early 90s, we've used visual tools, video systems in the form of uh, human-operated vessel submarines, ROVs, uh, tethered video landers, and uh, more recently, smaller underwater video landers. The people I've worked with are uh, Dr. Jen Cassell from UC Santa Barbara, Amanda Kahn, an invertebrate ecologist from Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, Andy Lauerman, a uh, marine biologist and ROV operator from Marine Applied Research and Exploration, uh, James Lindholm from CSU Monterey Bay, and uh, Brian Tissot from Cal Poly Humboldt. Uh, they uh, were all instrumental in uh, collecting and evaluating the data here. We also had a postdoctoral uh, researcher, Shelby, Shelby Ziegler, who worked on the data. And uh, I've listed a number of the key scientists who've worked with us to collect and analyze the data. In reality, there's probably another 20 people whose names could go on there. So it's it's been a big operation and uh, we're glad to have uh, been able to put it all together for you. Um, and that's not advancing for some reason. Is that, yes. So we're addressing mostly the parts of the Marine Life Protection Act that relate to the ecological goals understanding the natural diversity and abundance of marine life, uh, helping to uh, conserve marine life populations, and looking at representative and unique habitats. Um, I'm having trouble there, does that? It's not, there we go, now it's working, that's working. So I wanna direct your attention to uh, two different documents that we used extensively uh, for our analyses. Uh, one was the department's um, Marine Protected Area Monitoring Action Plan, which came out in 2018, which uh, identified priority MPAs and focal species, among other things. And then a document that came out in 2021 uh, from the uh, OPC's science advisory team that gave us scientific guidance or the ecological questions they wanted to ask about the effects of MPAs. So we use those two documents to structure our report and our, our studies. And as, you've, as you know, if you've uh, chosen to look in, we've been interested in the mid-depth rock habitats or those habitats between 30 and 100 meters deep. That's generally the, uh, from areas just past the edge of the kelp forest out approximately to the continental shelf uh, of California. So as I said before, it's a really important area. It has more than 200 fish species, uh, thousands of invertebrates, uh, about 80 uh, common fish species, 30 of which are different kinds of rock fishes. And this is where uh, most of the commercial and recreational fisheries uh, take place in California. So there historically has been a large human effect of, of on, the, on these areas. The other thing to know about this area is that it's um, somewhat unusual in that uh, it covers an area where we see uh, a lot of movement of fish. So typically we have mostly small fish in the shallower depths. And as we move deeper, we'll see larger and larger fish. And that's due to what's called ontogenetic movement of, of fishes. They'll settle out in near shore kelp forests, many of them, and they'll move into deeper waters as they get larger. So our understanding of changes in these habitats have to take into account the, the biology of those animals and their movements. And these are just uh, a number of different ways that we've collected data to learn about that. 
specifically today, we're talking about information that was generated from the Delta submersible uh, starting in 1993, and it went out of business in 2011. We're also talking about the uh, Beagle ROV, which uh, came into use in the early 2000s and is still in use now. Uh, it's undergone a few modifications and upgrades, uh, but it's um, still in use. I, my group worked with uh, first um, Marine Applied Ecology, uh, the MARI group, and Mavari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Group, to uh, build video landers and or design, they built them, and uh, use video landers starting in 2015. And the one we're using now is shown on the photo called the uh, BOSS, a Benthic Observation Survey System, uh, uses four pairs of stereo video cameras. All around the world, uh, there are researchers using intensively uh, baited uh, uh, remote underwater vehicles or mini landers, we call them here, where uh, their stereo video cameras or video cameras put in stereo on relatively light, small gear and tossed over the side of the boat uh, to capture video information for short periods of time. And that, technology is starting to be used in uh, the U.S. more and more. It's been used mostly in Australia and other places in Europe for, for many years now. The importance of this is that these are non-destructive tools. And so we're able to uh, go into marine protected areas, survey those areas without harming any of the fishes in there. And because that there's been this patchwork of tools, uh, we you, you can see that uh, we've used them in, uh, all over the state for a variety of different uh, reasons. And some areas more often than others, uh, some areas uh, for longer time periods than others. But a key here is that the tools and the technology and our ability to use the technology is constantly changing. Um, you would expect that as uh, electronics get better and as cameras get better. So one solution to figuring out whether or not a change we see in biology is due to the changing technology or due to the changes in the uh, marine environment is to uh, calibrate and understand the differences. Here's a, a graph of an example where we uh, did a test uh, between the video lander and the ROV beagle. And we found that uh, the mean difference in density uh, was zero. So the saying that the, oh, in terms of the means, the two tools looked uh, at pretty much the same fish. The ROV covers more ground and sees more different habitats. And so the RV surveys a larger number of species than uh, the video lander tool. Another way to adjust to the different tools and technologies is to use a tool independent analytical approach. And that analytical approach is what we've used. Um, and we're, we refer to it as an MPA response ratio to evaluate the expected MPA effects. And our, we expect that uh, abundance and density of fish and invertebrates to increase inside of MPA relative to a reference site, species diversity, the mean size and age of individuals, the biomass, which is a combination of size and um, or length and weight of an individual, and the reproductive outfit output. So as an example of the response ratio is the difference in mean size of a species inside the MPA relative to marines, the mean size of a species and its associated reference site. And that way we can look at uh, apples to apples rather than apples to oranges when we're comparing information from different tools over different years. So that, because if we're just looking at a ratio of 
uh, change, then it's going to be the same uh, for a different each different tool. So this is a little graphic that describes that. Um, it's called after control impact trajectory. So for the most part in California, we've initiated monitoring after the MPA establishment. We have some information on MPAs uh, before they were established, but for the most part, we have information afterwards. So if we look at this response variable, as I said, the example, we're looking at the uh, difference between um, a mean size of fish inside the MPA and the mean size of a fish outside the NPA. And that's the key variable that we're going to be measuring to see if things have changed. So si potential signs of MPA effect uh, are an increase in that response variable, such as mean size over time, while the size outside the NPA stays the same. The, size inside the NPA staying the same and the size outside decreasing. The increasing in the NPA and decreasing outside or increasing in both directions, but the difference between the NPA and the reference site uh, is increasing through time. So those are all expected uh, NPA effects or expected trajectories of this difference I just talked about. And it's important to tell you that the reference selection of the reference area outside the MPA is important when use this uh, approach. Okay, so what did we see? Uh, first of all, we looked at the habitats that uh, we surveyed, uh, in this case with the ROV, and you see that we did a pretty good job of selecting uh, reference sites here on the right uh, with the MPAs at Point Bouchon, and uh, this just are statistical ways of showing the differences in the amount of hard, mixed hard bottoms, soft bottoms, and soft mixed bottoms in both NPA and reference site. The take on point is those all look about the same. And so the uh, reference site for Point Vachon um, is good and we know what habitats there. And we need to know the habitats because uh, here's a graph of some work that we've done from the boss where we show that for given difference for different species, the amount of uh, fish you'd expect to see in hard, mixed, or soft bottoms varies by species. And in many cases, it's statistically significant. And so when we're comparing one MPA to a reference site or one MPA to another MPA, we need to be looking at the uh, proportions of bottom types and the densities as well. Now, fortunately uh, for us, the state uh, invested a lot of money in mapping the seafloor along the uh, state's uh, continental shelf. And that's uh, reaping a lot of great rewards for a lot of different researchers in terms of trying to understand both the distributions of species and potential effects of human uses on those habitats. Um, so we've taken some of that information and try to, um, and I'm going to call this high quality habitat. Please use that as a, a, um, a loose term. Um, we're certainly not trying to say that there's uh, a good habitat, and poor habitat. Uh, it's all habitat for something. But what uh, James Lindholm did was to uh, go through the literature to identify relationships of some of those species that I showed you a couple of slides ago with different kinds of habitats. And he found that many of the species that uh, we think of as really important species uh, for fisheries, for instance, were related to differences in the bathymetry, the substrate, the slope of the substrate and the complexity of the substrate. So then he's been able to use the maps that have been generated by the uh, mapping program in California to identify uh, what we're calling high quality rock habitat. And that, again, 
let's just call that a difference in habitat rather than um, putting a value on it. But we know that many of the species are going to uh, that we value are going to be in these higher quality habitats shown here in the darker colors. Uh, these red lines are NPAs and the blue lines are the reference sites. Um, but this also gives us a, a better idea of understanding the distributions of species and what to expect in NPAs and reference sites. So I've got a, a big table on the, on the screen and I'll give you 30 seconds to memorize it. Um, but in our report, you can go look and look at the amount of high quality habitat, generally in these high relief habitats and each MPA and reference site and in each buyer region. So that's helped us in our analyses. Also, here's a uh, graph showing differences in species relative to uh, bottom habitats. This is some work we've done from our video lander where we used a uh, Bray-Curtis dissimilarity matrix to identify where communities, fish communities are that are in common. And I'll just use these red ones as an example. We know that this is, these are all granite rock outcrops off Point Lobos. And you'll see that uh, those uh, species are all similar. Whereas uh, you get lower uh, cliff type rock habitats, lower uh, relief down here off uh, Piedras Blancas that are, are similar to the ones on the canyon edge here and then again up here. So we're now able to uh, use the information we've collected from these tools to uh, identify different species assemblages along the coast. And when we look at the data collected from the ROV, we'll uh, see that in any given region, the uh, species compositions are uh, pretty similar, but there are big differences among the regions. And so that's an important point that we want to highlight is that, and this is not something that's um, earth shattering because most people have known this for a while, that the communities are very different in different parts of the state. Now, when we were take the ROV data and um, look at the density of 43 different species at the Carrington Point uh, State Marine Reserve um, in red and the reference site in blue, uh, we see a hodgepodge of information. Um, I'm gonna expand that up so it's a little easier to see. And you'll see that in some cases we have the, uh, the density of fish outside of MPAs greater. In some cases, the density of fish inside are, are greater. And in some cases, there, we're just not seeing them there at all. Um, but we have those tables in our report. And more importantly, I um, want you to be thinking about those lines I showed you earlier. Are they converging or diverging or um, or doing something the same. And in this case, we have 11 focal species up in the North Coast. Um, and if you look at those, none of those are significantly different slopes. So the uh, areas inside the MPA and outside in the reference site are tracking the same. Pretty much it's similar for the Central Coast as well except you'll see this red, pink sea perch and red, the red box, uh, we see a di divergence where the densities are greater in the, oops, greater in the uh, reference site. Um, that I think is a sampling anomaly. We don't see that many pink sea perch on any of our surveys. So um, I think that's just a happenstance. But the take home message is we're not seeing much of a difference between MPAs and reference sites in the Central Coast. In the South Coast, it's the same thing except for a couple different species. The copper rockfish is increasing in the MPAs relative to the reference sites and California sheephead are increasing relative to the reference sites. And there are some 
uh, reasons for that, which I won't go into at the present time. But other than that, uh, the MPAs and the reference sites are tracking the same. In the uh, invertebrate category, we didn't see anything particular in the invertebrates happening except for the sunflower star densities dropping to almost zero as the sea star wasting syndrome uh, infecting killed populations all along our coast. Um, so if we look at uh, differences in mean lengths now, we were talking about relative abundance in terms of density earlier. Now if we look at differences in mean lengths, we see a, a similar story that uh, the MPAs and the reference sites uh, look alike. Now, we ha have to tell you that uh, in the early years, uh, most of these uh, points were uh, determined by uh, visual estimates using paired lasers as, an, as a tool. And we've learned in the last few years that uh, we get much more accurate estimates of lengths using the stereo video cameras. So those are uh, methods we're changing to. And the reason this is important is that when you look at the number of larvae produced by a uh, large rockfish, uh, it dramatically increases. It increases exponentially as you grow. And so a small change in growth makes a big change in the reproductive output of those animals. Okay, so let's now turn our attention to the uh, biomass, which is a, a measure that combines the number of fish we see and the size of fish we see. And again, uh, with our response ratios, we want to see an increase in the slope, uh, meaning that there's an MPA effect and a decrease in the slope means uh, there's a negative MPA effect. Or... So if we look at the uh, response ratios in the southern coast, uh, that, uh, and this is all, you can see it goes back. So these are all the data we have combined from all of the different tools. Some species are sh showing increases in biomass and uh, response ratios, and some are uh, showing negative uh, biomass response ratios. The bottom line is that we're not seeing any directional trend in the southern coast. And same thing is true for the central coast. You can see the dotted line being the trend. It's, it's basically flat. And in the north coast, it's uh, also flat. So we're not seeing uh, a biomass uh, uh, response ratios that indicate an MPA effect. However, in with sea cucumbers, when there where there's a, been a large fishery, we're seeing uh, many more MPA uh, excuse me sea cucumbers inside of MPAs. So that's a, a clear MPA effect for sea cucumbers. Also, uh, with the uh, Brev work in Southern California, we've pulled out targeted fishes versus non-targeted fishes. Targeted fishes mean those that are fished by people and seen in the Carrington point, a clear MPA effect uh, showing protection of uh, uh, fish species relative to unfished species. So if we look at biomass for all species combined within each region, you'll see that we're seeing an increase in biomass uh, since about 2010. So the question is, uh, if that's not an MPA response, what is it? Well, it is an MPA response, but the reason is, is that many groundfish stocks, especially rockfishes, declined below healthy population uh, in the 1990s. And that caused the Pacific Fishery Management Council to create a rockfish conservation area along the entire coast, the west coast, ranging depth from about 30 to 300 meters. So that's basically the continental shelf where we've been working. So it's essentially been a coastwide no-take marine protected area in California waters from 2002 to 2020. 
And Dr. Starr, I'm just flagging there's five minutes left. Okay. To open it up for public comment. Okay, I only have an hour Sorry. left. Sorry. Oh. No comment. Questions. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so the question is uh, why that? Well, um, we see that for some species like copper rockfish, um, they recruit um, more successfully than uh, other species. Interestingly, also, when we look at the heat wave, which caused so much damage, we see that there are good recruitment years for the, these 10 rockfish species, uh, or these 10 species, um, during that uh, warm heat wave time. If you look at the number of those 10 species with good recruitment years, you'll see there weren't many in prior to 2010, and we've seen many more since then. So, um, and now I'm gonna uh, try to walk you through some um, really detailed data. This comes from uh, juvenile larval surveys done by the uh, National Marine Fishery Service. And if you look at, this is the time period 2001 to 2010. I'll just tell you that the cool colors, the blues mean that there weren't many larvae in the water in that time period in the central California coast. Note that there were some in, Los, in the Southern California coast. And we compare that then with the 2011 to 2019 period. And there were uh, many more larval rockfish in the water. So each of these is a band coming down from the coast of Canada to the coast of Mexico. And the colors represent the um, number or abundance of uh, juvenile rockfishes in the water. So this is just showing again that we had uh, great uh, recruitment uh, in those years. So the larval production was good. And in Southern California, many of these are what we call dwarf rockfishes. So, and those are the smaller unfished species. So kind of summarize, um, that both, all of the California MPAs and reference sites uh, benefited from the rockfish conservation area. Uh, populations increased with time everywhere, uh, the abundance and density of fish and invertebrates increased, the species diversity, the mean size and age of individuals increased, the biomass did, and the reproductive output. Um, other key findings is that neither rocky reef nor high quality habitat is uniformly distributed. Um, as we all know, Northern Cal and Central California have more rock than Southern California. The reserve effects varied across everything, MPAs, management regions, and years, and some species showed uh, clear positive reserve effects. Uh, structure forming invertebrates such as coral sponges were found in greater densities in MPA than associated reference sites and I talked about the sea cucumbers. So our recommendations are um, to continue to monitor a few MPAs in each region and to more intensively monitor the MPAs to, to detect changes. If we're gonna see changes in these deeper MPAs, uh, they're probably gonna be more subtle than we've seen in the past because the past has been close to fishing and as fishing restarts up now it'll um, the changes we see will probably be smaller if at all uh, focus on the fish species which are the ones most likely to change but not ignore the other ones and then we need to acknowledge that we're advancing in technology um, and that we need to uh, take that into account as we're uh, analyzing our data into the future and continue the development of the synthetic analyses that we're doing. And that's what I've got for you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Rick, for that presentation. There's so much amazing information in there. And um, for those that didn't notice already, Rochelle put the full technical report that um, Dr. Starr and his team developed in the chat there. So um, I definitely would direct you to take a look at that. Um, there's a lot of amazing results and, and Rick just touched on a few of them today. Um, so now we have about 20 minutes to answer questions from the audience. 
Uh, we ask the topic, uh, the questions be relevant to the topic at hand, and we leave space for everybody to speak if you would like to. Um, if you want, you can raise your hand or you can drop um, your questions in the chat box. So I see right away we had a couple of questions come through during the presentation. So Jan had asked, how did you select your focal species? As I said early on, the uh, focal species were identified in the MPA action plan. Uh, those are the ones that uh, we used. Also, uh, we used the most abundant ones. Now, recognize that with these video tools, we're account counting everything we can see. So we're, um, we're capturing uh, everything we can see and identify. Uh, most of the, the analyses were for the focal species. And there are two reasons for that. One, there are focal species from the uh, MPA action plan. And two, it's just a um, function of statistics that the more abundant the fish is, uh, or the easier it is to detect changes. And so our focal species are all ones which also we counted a lot of. Great. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And I see in the chat that um, Steve Wirtz with the department is on the line too. So he's able to answer any more management specific questions. And he's dropped in that NPA action plan again, where you can see all of the species um, that have been identified through, um, through that process a few years ago. Um, Thanks, Jan, for that question. We have another one that came through the chat. Why would the reference sites have higher densities of certain species when compared to the MPA site? The, uh, the simple answer is there are a variety of answers possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, one reason is that the habitat's slightly different. And that for that particular species, the reference habitat might be um, more beneficial for that particular species. Uh, another thing that I didn't really talk about in this presentation is that there are there is some uh, aspect of random chance where juvenile uh, fishes settle out and. So you have some choice or preferences by the fish in terms of the habitat. You have some random chances as to where a clump of fish settled in and are living. And, um, and those are the primary reasons why you would expect to, um, to see the difference. Yeah, it's a tricky question to answer with so many species and so many variables contributing to that MPA effect. Um, I had a question along those lines. You touched on it in your last slide, but could you speak to some of the possible factors that contribute to the positive MPA effect you saw on the structure forming invertebrate? Well, uh, we're scratching our head about that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, some of the possible uh, reasons for that are uh, those uh, what work calling the higher relief and the higher rugosity rock habitats that may be more abundant in some of the MPAs. Um, the uh, type of rock is, is very important for the, uh, the structure in forming invertebrates. And uh, the water quality or clarity is, is really important as well. And so some of that has to do with um, the local geology, the sediment types, and the local currents. But uh, many of the structure forming invertebrates that we see uh, thrive on uh, strong currents and um, less turbid water. And so um, the current structure may have something to do with that as well. Great, I don't know. Are there any hands raised? I don't know if I can. Continue. No, a gentle reminder that if you'd like to, to speak, we'd love to hear your voices. If you can, you can press star three to raise your hand. 
you can't raise your hand, feel free to unmute yourself and we'd be happy to hear your voice and um, answer your questions. And um, you can press star six to unmute yourself if the unmute, if you're joining by phone, but I don't believe anybody is. Yeah, I don't see there. Thanks, Michelle. Mm -hmm. I have another question while people are, are getting the courage to speak up here, but um, what was the most unexpected result that you found throughout this process? What was the biggest change from your expectation? Uh, I, I mean, that's a really interesting question. I haven't really thought about that. But I would say off the top of my head, the um, most unexpected result was um, how well uh, the uh, MPAs were distributed along the coastline with respect to uh, the rock habitats and the, what we consider to be some of the better rock habitats is that um, I think that both MPAs and reference sites uh, contain a fair amount of good rock habitat in the central and northern coast. Um, as I said, in the southern coast, much of the rock habitat is constrained very close to shore. It doesn't go out in the deeper water except around the Channel Islands. Um, so I think that the MPA groups did a good job of uh, selecting areas. And uh, I was also a little surprised to see that there were not as many differences between the MPAs and reference sites as I expected. And uh, as I said, I think I, I've come to the conclusion that a lot of that is because we had the rockfish cons conservation area uh, for 20 years. Yeah, I think that's a really great point because um, one of the biggest concerns I'd say we hear from from folks in the public. Oh, I see some hands popping up. I'll wrap it up then. Is that you know there's a, there's been a thought that perhaps there's higher quality habitat in MPAs and this um, report you guys have pulled together really shows that there isn't that much of a difference. And so it helps us evaluate the MPA effect even even. Um, even better than we thought. So yeah, that was a great outcome. Of yeah, I, I agree. I think that the, um, and I, I think of the value of the marine protected area system as uh, being more valuable 50 years from now than it is now. And uh, the fact that we've got these uh, MPAs and reference sites that seem to have a relatively, relatively similar uh, species compositions and size compositions up and down the coast uh, means that we'll be able to uh, detect any changes that might occur to uh, global climate change or human uses of the near shore zone, wind farms, uh, better detect changes among um, the effects of uh, land activities on near shore oceans as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm I'm excited about that app, that result. Great, thanks, Rick. Um, I see a couple of hands popped up. I think Wendy, I saw your hand first. You can take yourself off mute and ask your question. Hi. Um, thank you so much for doing this. By the way, um, I really enjoy these. Uh, I was wondering if this kind of piggybacks on the last question. Um, you know that you didn't see a whole lot of change. Um, and when I looked at when I watched the kelp fest, uh, sorry, kelp, <laughs> kelp forest um, video, you know, they saw some really, um, really striking results. So I'm wondering if you if part of that is just because of the nature of the, um, the movability of the species that you were looking at that they um, travel in between the different uh, habitat zones where you might have been looking for them. I, I think that's a good point. Um, I've uh, told the kelp forest people, and I, I think that uh, some of the uh, changes they see are uh, due to this, um, I'll tell you, I'll say random, but it's um, not necessarily random, but random uh, uh, settlement of juvenile fishes. And so, especially in kelp forests, a, a group of fish and larvae can settle out and suddenly two or three years later, you'll see this huge increase in the number of fish in that spot. 
um, but then eventually they'll move out into deeper water. And that, that uh, location of that huge abundance of fish varies year to year based upon ocean currents. And so by the time we've seen uh, the, that um, stochastic is the name, uh, variation, the random variation, if you will, it's, that's evened out and smoothed out by the time the fish have moved out into deeper water. And so differences we see in the, the adults of these species are then due more to either the habitats that they're uh, living in or the fishing pressure on that area. Thank, Thank you. you, Wendy. Yeah, um, and thanks, Rick. It's, it's a tricky question to answer. And um, it's been really interesting seeing all of the different monitoring um, groups results come together. Um, I think Steve will mention this, but there's a, a working group through UC Santa Barbara that's taking all of the monitoring results and trying to do some integrative analysis to look for trends um, between all the different habitat groups. So um, stay tuned for that as they become available. Um, early next year. Um, I see Carla's hand is raised, so you can take yourself off mute. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Uh, my name is Carla, I work with a, a group um, called Azul. We, um, and so I just had a, a quick question on one of the points that you made in the very end. You said that potentially you were expecting some, or predicting that some of the changes in the MPAs may be subtle now that fishing was going to be opening up. So I just was wondering if with that, you were referring to um, the uh, rockfish conservation area ending, um, or if you could just explain a little bit more about what you meant by that. Yeah, um, that's exactly right. Um, so out in, outside of 30 meters deep, you know, basically in the habitats that we've been surveying, there's been this MPA for almost 20 years. And so, um, it's, we wouldn't predict an MPA. I mean, the re reason why we predict an MPA might have more fish in it than a reference site is that there's some stressor uh, removing or uh, keeping fish from growing on the other site. Typically that's uh, considered to be fishing. Well, if there's no fishing, that's the, the biggest stressor in these deeper, um, what I call more conservative waters. The habitat doesn't vary as much as it does in the kelp forest because uh, the water is generally uh, cooler and the variations in food uh, are mitigated a bit uh, from year to year. So um, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see uh, large changes now as the, we start going back in and fishing in the uh, RCA. Uh, we're probably not going to see big changes because fisheries management is going to regulate the fish populations uh, to be healthy. So any changes we see are probably going to be small or more subtle changes than we might uh, predict. So I think that uh, that's what I'm expecting and I'm expecting it to take place over time. Um, but it, uh, I don't know what it's going to look like. Great. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Tyler and Nick. Um, we have about five more minutes left in Q&A. Uh, so if you have a burning question, please raise your hand or drop it in the chat. Otherwise, I get to keep picking Rick's brain here. Um, I always enjoy digging into methods a little bit. Could you maybe touch on, Rick, and you, you did a little bit in the intro, but some of the pros and cons and, and benefits with each of the methodologies, the BOF versus the lander, um, and how might they be serving different aspects of the fish community and, and habitats? I think the, the pros and cons come are primarily related to the uh, goals of the, um, the use of the tools. Um, I kind of, I described that uh, for our uh, video lander, 
we came up with a, a same, when we tested it against their RV, for instance, came up with the same average densities, but the um, ROV uh, sees more different habitats. And so- How do I raise my hand? Pardon me? Sorry, it sounds like maybe someone's trying to raise their hand that might be on the phone. Um, I believe you wanna- Oh, oh I, I see, see you, Tom. Tom, okay. we'll get to you in just a moment. Okay. We so, so um, if your goal is to uh, uh, survey a large uh, habitat patch and see and count everything that's in there, then the ROV is a great tool for that. Uh, we designed the video lander for deeper water to uh, basically hopscotch, we call it, uh, along to uh, put the lander down in certain locations to get point estimates of fish populations. And so uh, the, the goal of that is to be able to cover larger areas uh, quicker and, and get a, a snapshot of the fish populations. So those are, you know, if, you're, if your goal is to survey one area intensively, then uh, it takes more time with a video lander to survey than it does the ROV. Um, on the other hand, if you're trying to get to a lot of different spots, the video lander uh, works better. And the same is true for the, uh, the bruvs, the smaller uh, events. You can use smaller boats, uh, go out uh, more cheaply, take a look at the areas in relatively shallow water just outside the kelp forest out to 50 meters deep or, or so. And uh, you get um, with the, if you bait it, you get some species in that you wouldn't see otherwise. Like uh, we see um, giant sea bass in the uh, Channel Islands because and ocean whitefish because they're coming in uh, to the, they're attracted to the bait. So uh, if your goal is to look at a species that might be there, but we wouldn't see otherwise, then you want to use the baited lander. So, uh, you know, each tool has its uh, strength and weakness, if you will. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for walking us through all that. Um, Tom, uh, you can go ahead and ask your question now. Hi, Rick. How you doing? Good, Tom. Good to hear from you. Yeah, good hearing you. So, yeah, you know, I've asked this question a few times and nobody can answer it, it seems like. But all that work we did right when the MPAs came, came on and um, we got all those traps built and went out and did all the surveying on the reference sites and inside the MPAs, how come we don't use that method anymore? Well, you're, <laughs> you're talking to the wrong person, Tom, because I pushed hard to uh, try to get uh, funding to use that method. For those who don't know, um, uh, Dean went from uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and I, uh, in 2006, uh, went up and down the coast to try to uh, develop two different uh, projects for monitoring MPA. One was the uh, California Collaborative Fisheries Research Program, where we used charter fishing boats to go out and uh, catch and release fish inside and outside MPAs. And the other one was the one that Tom is referring to where we used commercial fishing boats uh, and we built fish traps and we uh, fished uh, right outside the kelp forest in some cases inside the kelp forest um, to catch species that are not typically seen. They're more cryptic species that are not typically seen by scuba uh, surveys. And we got great information from that, Tom. Um, and we got good information on cabazon and black and yellow rockfishes and some other species. Uh, but we uh, were never able to secure funding to uh, turn that into a long-term project. OK, well, yeah, I was just kind of wondering about that. I mean, I really thought that was a pretty good project since we could cover so much area in a day, you know, we could, we, with the little transects that we had and the protocol that we came up with, well, I thought it worked pretty good for um, counting the fish in the MPAs and outside. I thought so too. And I think it ca captures a, a group of species that we don't see with other tools. Um, 
but um, Dean and I tried for probably five years to get money for that and uh, weren't successful. And well, somebody, maybe not, somebody will come up with some cash and we can do it again. You know? Hopefully, yeah. we can. no, we still have all those traps in storage. Yeah, no, I looked at my traps the other day. They're, everything's in good shape. Yeah. I mean, I haven't used them at all since yeah. I built them. We used them for the, the project, you know? Yeah. And not to put anyone on the spot, but um, Lindsay, Steve, do you have some insights on how the projects for for this long-term monitoring series were selected and, um, you know, ultimately the methods would have to be approved for the projects to be selected conceivably? Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Tom. Good to talk to you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Um, Steve was around uh, in those days. I was not, but I'm helping manage them now. So I know that there was a competitive call that was put out 2018 and projects were selected through that competitive process. Um, you know, I don't have more details off the top of my head, but I think Tom raises a fair point and Rick on, you know, methodologies and, and how the state has chosen to sample these different habitats. And um, as we already shared, there's that action plan that guides a lot of those methodologies. That being said, you know, with this adaptive management route we've chosen to take and the cicadal management review, um, there could be opportunity to change or amend um, methodologies moving forward based on results that we're seeing. So I wouldn't say we're, we're not going to reevaluate. Um, we want to make sure, as Rick has already shown, that there's consistency with methodologies moving forward, but um, we want to be able to adapt and change to the, the most appropriate method. Um, but I'll, I'll let Steve chime in if he has any other thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly the period. It was probably, probably during the live fin fishery when Rick was deploying those traps with Tom and um, over time, the projects that we have now have been very focused on the work they've been doing for many years and it doesn't discount the trap work, but it's just those aren't the types of surveys that have been done for long periods of time. And that's what was funded through OPC with those traditional long term monitoring projects. Um, so, yeah, that that's where we were. It's not like it um, couldn't be resurrected, but. Um, you need someone to actually propose that. You know, the funding climate is a lot different now than it was probably back when Rick and Tom were looking into this particular project. Um, and I can see, you know, I've done some trapping myself too, but um, I can see some positives, everything you describe, but then it's also kind of an invasive sort of uh, method where you're getting the fish combined in the trap and the pulling the trap, depending how long you soak the trap. You know, there could be some impacts to the fish, but I'm not saying that's why you shouldn't do it, but um, I think it's just maybe fallen off the radar. So it's something that could be uh, discussed. It's just, it wasn't uh, one of those core long-term monitoring projects that were part of the evaluation process. Great, thanks Steve. Um, we just have a few minutes left. So um, I'll turn it over to Steve to share a few slides and, and thoughts on the upcoming decal management review, and then we'll wrap it up. So if you wanna stick with us a few minutes after one, that'd be excellent. Great, thanks, Lindsay. And that was a great job, Rick. I really appreciated seeing the technologies and the results. It's gonna help advance the, the program. So, and it was a good way to wrap up the, the series. This has been an awesome series and Lindsay, really appreciate your hosting the, the webinars. It's been great. I've got a couple of minutes. You may be wondering if you haven't been following these series, why we're doing a decadal management review. And essentially planning for the network was done in 2012. And after that time, the department developed or updated its master plan for marine protectors from a siting and planning document to a more forward looking management uh, document to help us move forward in time. And two major outcomes was that uh, we established a 10-year management review cycle, and that was based on the life histories of many of the species found along the Southern California, or the entire California coastline. And um, we established an MPA management program, which is displayed in this slide. It's outreach and education, research and monitoring, which is 
you've heard have been following this series. A lot of the research projects are that part of the program. Uh, enforcement compliance and policy and permitting. So right now it's been 10 years since the establishment of the network. And so the department working with the Ocean Protection Council is developing a report. We call it the decadal management report. And there'll be many components. If you can advance to the next slide, please. So we'll be pulling in monitoring and research information from all the long-term monitoring projects and other research projects the state has funded. Uh, we've been working with California Native Americans to learn more about traditional ecological knowledge and to get their perspectives on the Marine Protected Area Management Program to advance it. Uh, we've been meeting with stakeholders throughout the state. We had a nice series last fall. Um, we answered questions and engaged the public. Um, and this webinar series has been great. We also have our MPA Decadal Management Review page where people can send the department questions, uh, not only about the Decadal Management Review, but anything they have would like about MPAs. Uh, we're working internally with our fishery scientists and enforcement to look through all the information that's been collected to help us inform this review. We were fortunate the Ocean Protection Council funded three of their advisory teams. One, uh, Rick mentioned earlier, they helped uh, refine the department's action plan questions to be more objective. Um, they also funded a team to look at the potential for MPAs to be resilient to uh, climate change. And uh, Lindsay mentioned a little earlier, NC is the National Center for Ecological Assessment and Synthesis. Uh, we're working with them to pull all this information together and to integrate it and try to make heads or tails out of it, which we know will result in more gaps in our knowledge, probably more questions that we need to ask. And hopefully it will uh, result in uh, future monitoring strategies. Uh, perhaps trap fishing could become a strategy moving forward. That's the whole purpose of this review, um, to develop adaptive management recommendations that the Fish and Game Commission uh, can select from to direct the department to work on. The Fish and Game Commission will get the department's report in February of 2023. It should be publicly available about mid-June because that's when we transmit it to the uh, Fish and Game Commission office. Uh, that's when NCs will also transmit their report. And the commission will, will probably at that meeting, the department will just be doing a walkover of what's in the report. But in March, uh, they have what's called a Marine Resources Committee. And we will be uh, really digging into the findings and the adaptive management recommendations at that point. And actually the day before that meeting, I think it's gonna be March 15th in Monterey, uh, we'll be having a symposium and we're working on the details. It'll be an all day event, uh, but it'll be a chance for all the partners and people interested to report out on each one of those management components. Uh, there'll be a plenary session, uh, posters. So we're really excited. We're just, but we're in the beginnings of uh, designing that. And all that information will carry over probably into the April Fish and Game Commission of 2023, where there'll probably be some direction to the department on where to, which, adaptive management recommendations to tackle. So I'll just uh, keep an eye out for that, check our webpage out. And if you could go to the next slide, <clears throat> this is a screenshot of our landing page. Uh, don't worry about writing these uh, links down. Um, they're being put in the chat, but feel free to reach out with us. Uh, we love to hear from you and uh, we get a lot of good insightful questions from the public. And uh, one thing that is kind of ancillary to this, I was gonna post it in the chat, is we've been working on translating our brochures um, from English to Spanish, to Vietnamese to Chinese. Um, and so they're gonna be available on our website for people who uh, would like to know where the MPA is and may not be a, prim a primary English speaker. So I wanted to get that plug in, even though it wasn't quite part of this. So with that, I just like to, uh, Pass the mic back over to Lindsay. And once again, thanks, Rick. Nice job. Thank you, Steve. And thanks again, Dr. Starr, so much for your presentation and everyone for sticking around and asking great questions. And for those that have participated in all eight, we thank you so much for listening in. 
Um, just to reiterate, you'll be able to find all the recordings on OPC's webpage. It's been shared in the chat. We also have a YouTube channel. And we'll be following up with um, more details on our listserv with resources from each of these projects moving forward. So with that, thank you for all the attention you've given our researchers. Um, there's just so much information to share, um, especially in light of the upcoming decadal management review. So thank you all. Have a great day.